They do an incredible job. We are so blessed to have them. All right. So before we get into the finale of God the Father, your nature, I want to tell you a story. All right? One day, there once lived a nobleman. He was kind, and he was wise, and he was good. His portfolio was vast. His land held mountains and streams and fields. One could say it was flowing with milk and honey. He continually was adding to his thriving kingdom, but he was always telling his people, listen, this is not just about today. What we will do will impact the future generations to come. He treated his people with dignity and respect, exercising his authority in good righteous judgment while keeping in mind the people who needed extra care, the widows, the orphans, and those in need. One day, he got called off to sea You see, he was thinking about taking on an extra large bit of territory, and he knew that these kind of transactions, they were complicated. So he thought to himself, I'm going to call the three wisest of my stewards. So in my absence, they'll watch over my territory and my kingdom so I won't have to worry about business ceasing. It can go on as usual. So he called his three most trusted advisors right before he left. They came to listen to what he had to say, excited of the notion of the kingdom expanding. They were surprised when he gave them each a large sum of money. He said, I want you to watch over my kingdom in my absence but do with this investment as you you wish, but remember my words and what I have said. Our kingdom is not just about today, but think about the future generations to come. And being the wise, kind nobleman that he was, he put no parameters around the money in which he gave them. They could exercise complete freedom So off he went to sea to finish his transaction. The first steward, well, he was the bravest of them all. In modern day context, he would be that man or woman who would look at a tech company, invest the money in stocks. You see, he planted new seeds in the vineyard. He sold goods in the marketplace that had never been tested before. He took care of the animals in the fields in a way that ensured max capacity of food. He was excited. He had all of these ideas and dreams stored up in his mind, and he was so grateful that the faithful nobleman gave him a chance to do what he knew that he could do for the kingdom, and he couldn't wait to tell him of the good report when he got home. The second steward... Well, one could say that his bravado was not as risky as the first. But you see, he had watched the kind nobleman from the beginning of his days of a youth. He knew what seeds to plant in the vineyard. He knew what goods sold best in the marketplace. He knew what the animals needed. And so when the wise nobleman entrusted him with money, he did it with full heart and faithfulness, meticulously taking care of everything. Perhaps not as courageous as the first, but he was faithful to the end and he could not wait to share with his master all of the things that he did in his absence. We're told something interesting about the third steward. You see, 
despite the actions of the faithful, kind, wise nobleman, he thought his master to be hard-hearted. And so when he was given the money, he took his bag, and in complete fear, he dug a huge hole. And while he was digging his hole, he buried that money in the ground, and guilt and shame and feelings of doubt started to rumble underneath. He knew something was wrong, but he thought to himself, it doesn't matter what seeds I plant in the vineyard. It doesn't matter what I sell in the marketplace or what I do to the animals. Nothing will be good enough because my master is hard-hearted. And so he covered the gold, and he walked away, never thinking of the money again. Much time passed, and one day, the nobleman returned. He set a grand dinner. He couldn't wait to invite his three faithful servants back. He said, good sirs, what did you do with the money that I entrusted to you? Well, We know the first two. They couldn't stop talking. One of ingenuity, one of faithfulness, telling of all the good reports of the vineyard, of the marketplace, of the fields and the animals. And the kind nobleman, you see, he smiled, but his gladness ran deeper because he knew that his servants understood that his mission and his vision was not just for the good of the people here today, but they got it. His kingdom would last for generations to come. He noticed, though, that the third steward sitting at the table didn't say much of anything, and so he asked him, Good sir, what did you do with the money that I entrusted to you? The third steward, he clumsily, he, he pulled that old bag of money out from underneath the table, now full of holes and dirt. He set it in front of his master. And he said, I was afraid of you. I knew that no matter what I did, it wouldn't be good enough, and so I buried it in the ground, ensuring that at least you would get your money back. And the nobleman was shocked. He said, why, why would you do that? You, you have seen my character. You know who I am, how I treat my kingdom with dignity and respect, with justice and fairness. I could have put my money in the bank and got interest back. Why would you do such a thing? And again, The steward looked at him and said, because I was afraid of you, I thought you were a hard man. And in that moment, the great nobleman's sadness and shock quickly turned to anger because you see he realized in that moment it didn't matter what he had shown him. The kindness, the history, his legacy You see, in his mind, he doubted his character, and he knew that this man could never help him with his mission or his vision of advancing the kingdom, but also really that this man was a slave. So he banished him. Friends, many of you have recognized the story of which I tell is one that Jesus told his disciples in the New Testament. And yes, I have taken some great liberty and changed some of the nuances to the story, but at the heart of the matter, it remains. We have used this parable to exercise our gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given us. We have used this parable in contrast to interest and money earned and dividends and all sorts of things. And while that is applicable, and good, the heart of the parable is we are more like the third steward than what we could ever think or imagine. 
God has been showing his nature from the beginning of time, creating you out of pure love and grace, knowing what was going to happen in Genesis chapter 3, doing everything in his power to advance his kingdom, reminding you it is not just about today, but the generations to come. But if what we think about God goes in contrast to what Scripture says and what he says to us, it doesn't matter because we are a slave to our own thoughts. We will continue to do things out of fear that will end up ruining our lives. So today, as we discover what Scripture has to say about God being a good father, Let's assess what we think of and what comes to mind about who he is. Let's pray. God, we come to you today. And as we wrap up your nature, Father, we are reminded that you are a good father. You are holy. You are righteous. You are infinite. You are ever-present. You are perfect, you are amazing, but you love us. You forgive us, you redeem us, and you sanctify us, God. You have a purpose for every single one of us that are watching here today online and that are in this room. God, I pray, may our thoughts about you align to what you say in Scripture. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. All right, so in uh, 2003, I believe, there was a movie by the name of Bruce Almighty. Anyone remember it? Yeah. So uh, Jim Carrey, Jennifer Aniston, and Morgan Freeman were the stars of that movie. And trust me when I say I'm not validating it is theologically very incorrect. <laughs> but it is a funny movie. And throughout, we meet this character named Bruce. And he is a very upset, angry man. He has a really bad couple of days. He's a news anchor and he goes and he starts blaming everything on God. He thinks that he's gonna get this promotion and then he gets beat up and he's back at home. And really, there's beautiful one-liners in the movie. Morgan Freeman's voice as God is literally kind of how I hear God's voice sometimes. It is beautiful and amazing. There's this one part where Jim Carrey goes, where are the miracles? And Morgan Freeman goes, you are the miracle." like, yeah, that's good. But there's this one part where he's fed up and Jim Carrey comes in and he does all the wacky leg hand movements. It's what makes him an incredible actor. And he's talking to Jennifer Aniston and he's upset. And he says, God is a mean kid sitting on an anthill with a magnifying glass. And I'm the ant. He could fix my life in five minutes if he wanted to, but he'd rather burn off my feelers and watch me squirm. I think the movie resonated with millions of Americans because I think if we were honest with ourselves, we have thought the same thing a time or two. God could fix my marriage in five minutes. God could fix my finances in five minutes. God could fix my medical health issue, my job, so on and so forth, and yet he doesn't. In this series, it has been so amazing, and if you haven't watched, for those of you who are watching online and for all of you in the room, you can go ahead and pull up your app. We have some notes that we're going to go through together, but we started about four weeks ago, and Pastor Jason, he dived right in into the Trinity, right? He talked about a 30,000-foot view of what the Trinity is, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all individual personhoods, all together in perfect harmony and unity. And then Pastor Josh, we kind of flipped it upside down. Most were expecting we're going to talk about Father God, but no, we talked about the Holy Spirit, the most ominous one mysterious in nature. He lives inside us the same power that rode Jesus from the grave now lives inside of you and I for those of us who believe. 
Pastor Josh said some jokes about Halloween or something and was like, I don't know about any Holy Ghost, but the, or I don't know about, yeah, any Holy Ghost, but the only Holy Ghost is in my house is the Holy Spirit. I just totally biffed that, but he said something funny. <laughs> he reminded us about how the Holy Spirit is our advocate, our counselor. He convicts us. But we, we lean on him to grow us in the fruit of the Holy Spirit in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And then Pastor Jason, the following week, he provided the bridge between the Holy Spirit and God the Father, right? Jesus, probably the most familiar to me and you in this room and those of you that are watching. Yes, he died on the cross, but he stayed in perfect harmony, only doing what the will of the Father was while being in authority and complete power of the Holy Spirit. And if for any other reason that you should go back and watch it, um, if you were here last week and you've never seen a pastor perfectly flip a table over in complete synchronization, it was like the matrix. I was sitting over there and I was like, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. There was coins and stuff, and I watched some of your faces, and then all of a sudden, he was like, yeah, and it flipped over perfectly, and I was like, that's amazing. (laughs) It was awesome. And now we're at God the Father, and we have been saying this one sentence over and over and over again, and I want you to write it down in your notes. We cannot trust, follow, or obey God if we do not know him? We have been asking this question, floating that around for the past weeks. Let me say it one more time. We cannot trust, follow, or obey God if we do not know him. And I wanna add to that, if we do not know him correctly. A.W. Tozer said that the most important thing that comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing. So let me ask you, what comes to your mind when you think about God the Father? Are you like the third servant? Is he absent? Is he mean? Is he kind? Does he love you? Psychology today, Christians and sociologists have done certain studies across how people relate to God. And we're gonna show you some of the most popular ones um, because I think it's important. We can talk all day about the characteristics and the nature of God, but if you don't recognize your own thoughts or how we can kind of compartmentalize God the Father, it can be a dangerous thing. That's how we end up like the third steward. So the first one in a slide that we're going to show you is the Santa Claus God, right? God the Father is this type of essence or being that's somewhere in the clouds. He's in the sky. He's making a list, checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice, you back row seaters. But seriously, right? He swoops down every once in a while, and he gives good gifts to the good children. Checks off his list. And then he swoops down, and he gives coal and hail and fire and brimstone to the bad ones. He is not present. He is not overly concerned with our day in, day out conversations. He's just Santa Claus God. The next one, and I need to apologize beforehand because this one's probably going to hit closer to home a little bit. This is more of a religiosity God, more of a tradition God. Um, And I know that we live in the Bible Belt, but it is um, the vending machine God. Here's my tithe, here's my prayer, here's my service, God, here's what I did for you, here's my devotion time. Now, I would like this house on a hill. I need this job. 
I want those two and a half kids. I need my mom, whatever it might be. And what happens when we think that God is about responding to what we do for him when we don't get what we want? We become disillusioned, we become disheartened, and we get angry. And can I suggest one other thing to you? Have you ever thought, we're talking about the Trinity, right? Do you ever get mad at the Holy Spirit? No. No, you don't. I've never talked to a girlfriend or in counseling or anything, and you're just like, man, I'm so mad at the Holy Spirit, and you point inside. Because that's weird, first of all. The Holy Spirit's supposed to help you, comfort, guide you, right? Have you ever been mad at Jesus? If you have, I I question a lot of things about you. You can't get mad at the person who died for you. The one who heals, washes our feet, goes back up to the Father. Have you ever thought about that? But when we do get upset, which we can, there's an appropriate time to be angry about things. We go through things naturally. We lose someone important to us, a job, The past two years have happened. Who do we raise up our fists at? Why is it God the Father? I suggest because there is a human ache inside every single one of us that wants to know at the end of the day that God loves me, that he is good and he is kind. And so when we question that, when we go through life sometimes, it's appropriate at times. God can handle it, but we've got to get back to the center and understand that God is always a good father. All right, so today's sermon has two parts. That's it. How can we know who God is? Point number one, God has a name and it's Yahweh. I need everyone to try to say it. Yahweh. Yahweh. Well, we'll try that one more time. Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Yahweh. Yahweh. You're like, how does that help me, Jen? (laughs) Yahweh was used in the Old Testament and actually throughout Scripture 5,321 times. It is the name that is most referenced to the Lord. The significance of his name, Yahweh, it emphasizes his changeless, all-powerful, all-knowing, glorious, holy self-existence. And all of these things, which I'm about to tell you, these are the things that you know. This is what the church teaches you, right? God is omnipresent. He is all-powerful. He is not constrained to time and space. Those are what we call his incommunicable attributes, those attributes that you and I do not have, only God. And then those communicable attributes that he is holy and he is loving and he is full of justice and mercy and compassionate and kind. Those are transferable, communicable attributes. We are made in his image and we can share those with God. But I was thinking, how does that help us when we have a mental image that is different comparative to those attributes that are listed? Better question, let's even go further than that. How did they get those attributes listed? How did they know this to be true about God? And so I want to enter into a story between Moses and Yahweh. And we're going to pick up a couple other things in scripture. But the reason why it's so important to know his name is because you're hearing the testimony of other people in scripture that proclaim what is true about the Lord and how they walked with him and how he was present with them. So the first story that we're going into is found in Exodus chapter 3 verse 13. And we're going to enter in the middle of the story. Long story short, Moses is a murderer. He used to be a prince of Egypt. He gets cast out. He's been wandering the wilderness for years and years and years. And the Lord shows up and he tells him to take his sandals off. You're standing on holy ground. And I want to use you to go take my people out of Egypt. 
And Moses pretty much says no, and God says yes, and Moses says, but I have a lisp, and God says, I don't care, I'm going to use you. And so that's the kind of point that we're entering the story. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and you say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. If Morgan Freeman was saying that right now, it would sound a lot better. But think about that from a practical standpoint. That's not what I want God to tell me in that moment. So I'm supposed to go tell the Israelite people, I am sent me to you. How crazy does that sound? Sounds cool reading it back. I guarantee you it did not sound as cool to Moses. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. The reason why the significance of his name Yahweh, because it emphasizes his changeless, all-powerful, all-knowing, glorious, holy self-existence, but it highlights his presence with his people. He loves his people. He is faithful to his people. He keeps his promises to his people. And it confirms his power to work on behalf of his people. So here's just a couple quick examples. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham, remember the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he has promised Abraham a son, and his son came really late in his old, old age, birthed Isaac. And later on, in li- later on during the time, God then comes and shows up and he says, I want you to take your son and I want you to go sacrifice him to me. Much after the burning bush moment, no, sorry, before the burning bush moment, Abraham's like, what? You, this is what we've been working for. I trusted you. And he's been walking and following God. He's like, okay. And so he takes Isaac. And long story short, they get up on top of the mountain. And God provides an angel and a ram. And he looks at Abraham. And the whole point is thank you for listening, following, and obeying me. But I'm not going to ask you to provide something that I am going to do for the whole entire world. I am going to give up my son. So Abraham calls the Lord Yahweh Jireh. The Lord will provide. In Exodus chapter 17, after the burning bush moment for Moses, later on in his life, when the Israelites are being attacked by the Amalekites, He's followed, Moses has followed the Lord and he's listened to him. He's seen the Red Sea parted. He's seen the fire by day, cloud of smoke by night, all of these different things, manna coming from heaven. And the Lord is telling Moses, stand up on top of the hill. Do not let your arms fall down. If you keep your arms stretched out, I will give you victory. So Moses is like, okay, I got you. He's standing up there so long that his arms start to fail and Aaron and her come out and they hold up his arms. And yes, Israelites get the victory. You know what he names him? Moses builds an altar and names him Yahweh Nisi. The Lord is my banner. One of my favorite stories is Judges chapter six. Gideon, part of the weakest clan in all of Manasseh. And not just the weakest clan of Manasseh, he is the weakest family member in the weakest clan of all of Manasseh. Anybody else feel like the oddball weakest family member? Me? The Lord visits him and says, I'm going to use you. I got to rescue the Israelites again. And Gideon's like, hmm. And eventually he listens. You know what Gideon names the Lord? Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is my peace. I can't imagine what thoughts of insignificance plagued him. Finally, King David, 
Psalm 23, probably the most popular psalm uh, or the top 10 of all time. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside quiet waters, he restores my soul. The name is Yahweh Roy. My point is, yes, you cannot follow, trust, obey God unless you do not know him. But there comes a point in time that to really know him is to follow, trust, and obey God even when you're not sure. He has provided scriptures and boundaries and things for us to stay. Oh, don't have sex with that other person until you're married, but God. I don't want you to make those bad, wrong financial decisions, even though everybody else around you is doing this, but Lord, I want you to lift up your arms and hold whatever it is. He asks us to do weird things sometimes. It's true. But you know what happens when we follow, trust, and obey him? then we know we know he is good because we put the test of what we've been told, what we've read over and over again, and we experience his faithfulness. The third steward, if he would have not buried that gold and he would have went out and trusted him, he would have experienced the nobleman as faithful. We've gotta be able to get past the point of not just knowing it in scripture, but testing it out in the real world so that God can show you the Lord is your banner. The Lord is your peace. The Lord is your shepherd. The Lord has a name and it is Yahweh. Listen, I am preaching to myself here. I think it's Pastor Jason asked me to first preach this, and I was like, that was my face, I think. I've alluded to my story a little bit before, but I have had significant um, father issues in my life. And um, my dad and I, we have reconciled. We've, it's been a long road, and we still are a little bit. But... I, I had a hard time being able to trust and understand that God is good and God is faithful and that he is a loving father for a plethora of different reasons. I didn't know how to do it. I married my husband, Michael. Many of you know that we have three beautiful daughters and I have been able to watch him Father, our children in a way that has healed my soul and my heart in ways that I could never have imagined. By looking at his daughters and saying, this is a safe place. You will never circumvent my love. I am always here for you. And leading them in authority and discipline always with perfect love and care. Not perfect, human dad love and care. Point, part number two, and actually I want to show this video to you because I wanted to show you how I relate to God sometimes, but Mike needs to get away from us sometimes, and so he goes out on the riding lawnmower because there's only so much you can put up with three girls, four girls in the house. He needs to hear, smell the grass and, you know, get away from us pretty much. So I was watching May May, and this is what happened in our house. My Maymay is like the sweetest thing ever. But I went back and I watched that. And can I be honest with you? Sometimes I feel like that's how God is with me. He's got work to do outside. More important work than to tend to my needs. He doesn't see me. He doesn't hear me. 
and I'm beating on the window. God, God, are you there? And I know I'm not alone in that. So part number two that you need to know and understand deep down in your bones is that God has a position and that is of a good father. It changes from Yahweh to father in the New Testament for a very good reason. Actually, the Lord is referred to as father over 530 times in the New Testament alone. It emphasizes his loving nature to be a good father. It highlights his faithfulness to bring us back home again. And it confirms that his power is made available for you to be formed in the image of his son. You see, the reason why Santa Claus or vending machine God doesn't work is because God's primary concern isn't about your success. It's not about your comfort. It is not about what you want all the time. He is not a genie God. His name is Yahweh. He is holy. He is righteous. But it is about to bring you back home again. And he wants to see you made in the image of his son. And he can use then all things for good for those that love him and are called upon his purpose. So one last story we're gonna enter into and it's found in Luke and many of you know it's the prodigal son because this is the most perfect picture of who our God is, that he's not a God in the clouds. We're in verse 20 and the prodigal son, he's left, right? He's taken all the inheritance, he spent it all on prostitutes, on drinking, on whatever. He found himself in a pig sty. And he's like, oh, if I go back home, at least I can be a servant. So he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son. He was once dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is now found. And they began to celebrate I want you to notice something in the story. Did God go to the pig pen and pick his son out of the trough? No. Did God go looking in the streets while he was spending his money? Nope. The son had to come to his senses. He had to be willing to come back home. God's waiting. Right there, the edge of the gate, and he watches. He means it when he says, heaven has no greater celebration than a sinner that comes back home because he wants to be in union with you forever. For those of you that are watching and in this room, I'm so sorry that if you've never experienced a biological father relationship like that, I know how hard that is. But that's not who God is. Even the best of fathers comes nothing close to how loving and kind and gracious God the Father is to his children. Men, can I say something? You are either the largest blessing to your children in relationship to their relationship with God. Or you can be one of the biggest deterrents. And you've seen it. We have a generation of kids that have a hard time connecting with God because they don't know how to do it. They don't know that they're loved, that they're worthy, that they have a plan. My favorite verse in all of scripture in the Old Testament is Hosea. And this is a picture of God as father. 
He says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like the one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. When is the last time you thought of God the Father as bending down to your cheek to feed you, to heal you, to love you? Romans tells us that this is exactly the purpose. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves like that third steward so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. So again, I ask you, what comes to your mind when you think about God? because it could be the most important question that you consider. As we wrap up this series, we are gonna take communion together. You can find the elements located underneath your seat. And it's gonna look a little bit different today. And as always, Here at Ignite, we invite every single one of you to participate in communion with us. As long as you have professed faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you do not need to be a partner or a member. But for those of you who have not yet, we ask that you abstain. But I would like to say, if you have not made a decision, don't leave here today. The Father stands and he's watching you. So as we take communion, you can go ahead. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to bow your heads. We're not going to just remember through the lens of Jesus today. We are going to pray and we're gonna lift up forgiveness in any way that we have wrongfully thought about God but we're gonna look and take and receive communion through Father God's eyes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you a broken people. The fact that you have granted us grace to know you, to know who you are, to speak your name, Yahweh, to experience you as a banner of love over us, as peace, shalom. And God, the fact that it cost you everything. God, I pray that we are honest today as we partake of communion. Forgive us of the things and how we viewed you incorrectly, how we have ran away in fear, Lord, restore us, renew us today. We love you so much. In your name I pray, amen. You can go ahead and take off the first covering and take the wafer in your hand. And the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Father God says, this this cost me my son to bring you back home again. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. You can go ahead and lift the second part of the juice. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
And God the Father says, I was there that night when Jesus asked to take this cup away from him. And I told him no, because I wanted you to come back home again. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Father, thank you for doing everything to bring us back home. God, I pray that as we leave here today, that we walk out of here with a renewed sense of sonship and daughtership that you have been calling us to from the beginning of time, God. It changes everything. You are not just concerned about your kingdom today, but for future generations to come. Lord, heal us. We love you so much, Jesus. In your name, I pray. Guys, thank you so much. We don't want this series to end here today. Keep learning about God. Get involved in equip class. Find resources. Don't leave here today if you need to talk to someone um, from our prayer and care team. We'll see you next week for a brand new series called um, It's Your Neighbor. We love you guys. Thank you so much.